talking about length of speaking, my wife had to take Sister Michelle Shepherd to the to the airport this afternoon. So she told me, make sure you preach till I get back. And so I don't know how long it's going to take her. And so if I'm go long today, it's you know maybe because she's not here yet. Uh, some of you guys might pray that there's no traffic jams or anything of that nature. But she told me to preach till she gets back. And so whenever she does get, oh she's here. I'll, I'll, yeah, marking them a point in the back. Ah, look at that. She just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's back there, man. So she, she's messing me up here. <laughs> so good to be here, man. Let me tell you, our cups have been filled this week. I heard someone say just a moment ago that, uh, man, we got to got to go back and, and finish up here, man. We're so full. And I know that they were talking about they were full, physically speaking, and and I want to reiterate what has been said already in regards to our sisters. Our beautiful sisters here, all of the hard work they put in, I'm well aware of the fact that some of our sisters from neighboring congregations have also jumped in there and have participated valiantly in helping us to make sure that we have been physically nourished on this week, and we want to extend to you our most sincere thanks. We appreciate you guys so very, very much. We love you. The Lord's Church simply would not be without the sisters that have so long been an integral part of the kingdom of Christ, and so appreciate you guys so very, very much, but but I know she's talking about physical food being full physically, but not only that, man, spiritually we have been filled to the absolute brim on this week, man, who have participated in the Men's Development Conference, our gospel meetings over each night, and I first began to participate in the Men's Conference at the uh, invitation of Brother Jason and Brother Dink a number of years ago, about three years ago. Man, when I went back home, my commentary was, man, that is one of the best lectureships I've ever been to. Man, there's absolutely just no fluff. There's no fluff there, man. There was nothing that was not good. There was nothing that wasn't edifying. There wasn't anything that was not well-researched and in-depth. And so we are forever thankful uh, for the type of men that our elders bring in here to participate in this good work. And this year has been second to absolutely none. Matter of fact, I think we're getting better as the years go by. One of these days we're going to have to figure out where in the world we're going to do about housing people to be able to come here because this thing is growing and we thank God so much for that. We hope that he's been glorified in us. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but I am an inventor, an inventor. And so I've got my handy dandy uh, inventive workshop and during the times that we've been on break, man, I've been just inventing, man. I started on Monday, Brother Jason, started inventing, and, and I come up with a great invention. I think it's going to change the world. I really do. It is a light bulb. Light bulb. So I invented this on Monday. Invented this on Monday. I really think that it's going to be groundbreaking. Think that it's going to change the world. I think it's going to make some things different for us, better for us in the world in which we live. Uh, this incandes incandescent, high resistant electric light bulb. Just invented that. What do you what do you think about that? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly right. Robin, um, one of my daughters in, in the faith, she's laughing at me over there. You 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 would think someone was crazy. You'd think that they were absolutely deranged if they were being serious. Obviously, I'm not being serious here, but if I were being serious or someone was, you would think that they were absolutely deranged. If it were the case that Brother Dink and Brother Jason and I came and told you today that, look, man, we've been sitting at the computer and we've been writing software and we've been working very, very hard all hours of the night and we've been doing this over the course of the last two or three months and we come up with a social media platform that we want to present to the world. It's called Facebook. We want to present that to the world, we want to unleash that on the world. Man, you would think that we had lost our marbles. Certainly so. I want to look at something maybe a little bit more serious than that. In 1859, the textual critic by the name of Constantin Tischendorf uh, had gone over to explore in and in, around the Sinai Peninsula, went to the base of, of Mount Sinai, and there is a monastery there called St. Cath Catherine's Monastery, 
and he's looking for different manuscripts of the Bible. Of course, we talk about a manuscript of the Bible. We're talking about copies that have been made. We know that we don't have the originals of what Paul wrote. I'm talking about their autographs is what I mean by that. We don't have the literal paper that Paul wrote on. We don't have what Peter wrote as far as the actual parchment or papyrus or whatever it was that he may have written on. But of course, and, and for very good reason, God probably didn't allow that to, to continue to survive. But we do have copies, multiple copies. As a matter of fact, when it comes to the New Testament, textual criticism will tell you that we have some 5,700 different manuscripts. And a manuscript is a copy of a document that is written in the exact same language that the original was written in. So over 5,700 Greek manuscripts. And so Constantin Tischendorf in the 19th century was interested in textual criticism. He would go over and visit his monastery, and in his time there, he would find uh, the the Sinaitic, or Sin Sinaitic, however you want to pronounce that, uh, codex. And this is a complete copy of the New Testament, and it dates to the middle of the 4th century A.D., in other words, in the 300s. And so you can understand how very important that particular manuscript is. We heard Brant talking about it a couple of days ago. He mentioned the big three when it comes to these manuscripts that the archaeologists and textual critics have found. They got what they call the big three. They got the Vatican Codex. They've got the Sinaitic Codex, and they've got the Alexandrinus Codex. And so basically uh, named by the places where these different copies of the Bible were found. And so he finds this, again, in 1859, around 1860. And so he actually manages to secure this manuscript and present it as a gift to the Tsar of Russia at that time. He was being funded in his exploits and his endeavors by the Tsar of Russia. And so he felt indebted to him. He wanted the manuscript in the first place to be able to copy it himself and study it. But then he also wants to present it as a gift to the Tsar of Russia. He's able to do that. He gets with the abbot of the monastery, and he's able to secure exactly what it is that he wants. I didn't read the history any further to find out if the deal really transpired the way that it was supposed to, if there were some, some shady things that happened there. But nonetheless, he acquires it. That manuscript is in the British Museum right now. The British, the Brits acquired it from Germany a number of, uh, from uh, Russia, rather, a number of years ago. They decided they needed the money more than they needed the manuscript, and so the Brits paid $500,000 for it. So it's in the British Museum right now. Here's the point I want to make. There was a known forger who comes along a little bit later, around 1862, and he says that, look, that manuscript that Tischendorf found, well, he didn't really find that at this monastery, and it's not really as old as he claims it is. He says, as a matter of fact, I wrote that just not too long ago. I wrote it myself. And so I want you to think about it. He said he wrote it in 1840. And so think about that. Think about that. They find this, this groundbreaking manuscript. You got a charlatan that comes along and says, no, I'm really the one that wrote that. Well, here's one that's even more serious than that. We know that the foundational, that the most monumental, most profound thing that has ever occurred in human existence is what we read about in John chapter 3, verse number 16, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul writes in the book of Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4, that when the fullness of the times had come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. When we talk about God giving his son to this earth, when we talk about Christ Jesus being manifested in the flesh, can you think of any event that has occurred in human history that is more profound than that? that is more groundbreaking than that, that is more critical to our existence both now and in, in eternity, that is more important than that. Well, here's something that hits a little closer to home for you guys who are indigenous to this particular area. We, we're uh, newbies around here, been here about four months, but in Waco a number of years ago, you remember a guy by the name of David Koresh, right? What a tragic, tragic occurrence in human history and the history of the United States of America. Here's this guy. He called himself David Koresh. His real last name was Howell. Vernon Howell was his real name. But he called himself David Koresh. That should tell you a lot about the charlatan that this guy was just because of that. But here's a man who claimed that he was the incarnation of the return Christ Jesus. How heinous is that? How despicable 
of an action was that? And certainly when you look at all of those who were naive enough to, to follow this guy, and we know the tragedy that occurred as a result of them following him, uh, we understand this is something that's absolutely despicable. Well, I want you to consider something on this afternoon. I want you to consider the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ established the church of what of which we are a part. Brother Jason did a, did a beautiful job just a moment ago telling us why he is a member of the Church of Christ. And guess what? Whenever Dave, Jason is preaching, every last one of us who have obeyed the gospel in here, we can relate to what it was that he was saying. We are members of the Church of Christ for the exact same reason that Jason is a member of the Church of Christ. We think about the Lord's Church, and, and I've got a set of peas as well. Jason, I don't know if Jason ripped this off from me or what, but uh, i got a set of peas as well, but my wife did not tell me that I could not do these, and so I'm going to use that old Baptist uh, type of, of reasoning and she didn't say I couldn't and so I'm going to go ahead and use my peas as well. When it comes to the Lord's church here's what I want you to consider real quickly about the Lord's church this is the only church the church that we read about in the Bible my friends is the only church that was purposed in the mind of God in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 Verse number 3 through verse number 5, of course, the Apostle Paul, matter of fact, back up to verse number 1, Paul, an apostle, <clears throat> pardon me, of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. And so right at the outset, Paul tells you who it is that he's writing to. I'm writing to the saints that are in Ephesus. My friends, you know that the only ones that the Bible refers to in the New Testament context as saints are those who are members of the Church of Christ. I know Roman Catholicism has done with that what they wanted to do with it. And then Brent talked about that the other night. But we understand the truth of the matter is that whenever the Holy Spirit refers to saints, he's talking about members of the Church of Christ. And so Paul says, I'm right writing to those saints who are in Ephesus. I'm writing to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Of course, we have this typical greeting. Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The point that we're making is that the Lord's church is the only church that was purposed in the mind of God. What does he say in the next verse? According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good purpose of his grace wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved and so as Jason pointed out a moment ago we will reiterate I don't mind doing that brother we ought to be speaking the same thing right you mentioned first Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 10 got no problem if we say the same things and we're on the same page we should be that's what Paul requires us to be first Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 10 I beseech you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together and the same mind and in the same judgment and so Jason pointed out that whenever we look at that terminology that vernacular that language of the Ephesian letter then we understand beyond any shadow of a doubt that the Lord's church was not an afterthought it wasn't an audible call at the line of scrimmage the way that brother Avon Malone used to always put it says you, know, you look at these premillennial people and they look at the church as though it was an audible that the Lord called at the line of scrimmage God sends them down here the play is to set up the kingdom he looks out over the defense, the Jews who hated him, and he realizes he can't do what he wants to do. He's got to call an order, but what a ridiculous doctrine. What a ridiculous doctrine. The church was purposed in the mind of God. But not only that, we're talking about a church that was promised, or excuse me, prophesied by holy men of God. The book of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 21, 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Who? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so there is but one church, my friends, that is purposed in the mind of God. There is but one church that is prophesied by holy men of God. And we'll talk about some of those prophecies a little bit more detail, just a little little bit later. But in the third place, it is the only church that is promised by the Son of God. Jason mentioned this one as well. Matthew 16, verse number 18. Christ responding to the confession that Peter made. That thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, says, uh, that is exactly right, Peter. And, and flesh and blood is not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And also I say unto you that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church in the gates of Hades, shall not 
God prevail against it. And so we find our Lord promising the church of the Bible is going to be built. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. There is but one church that was purposed in the mind of God, but one church that was prophesied by holy men of God. There was only one church that is promised by the Son of God. There is only one church, my friends, that was purchased with the blood of God. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. We've heard this one multiple times on this week as we talk about the church of Christ versus denominationalism. Paul would tell the elders of Ephesus in the book of Acts chapter 20, in verse number 28, at the conclusion of his third evangelistic mission, he's on his way back to Jerusalem, but he meets with his good friends, the elders there at the Ephesian congregation in Miletus, and he tells them to take heed to themselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Only church, only religious institution that has ever, ever come to fruition with the purchase price of the blood of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so there is but one church that is purposed in the mind of God. There is but one church that is prophesied by holy men of God. There is but one church that is promised by the Son of God. Only one was purchased by the blood of God. And here's where we want to be for this afternoon. There is but only one church that was produced by the Spirit of God. One church produced by the Spirit of God. Join me in the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we begin there in verse number 1 of Acts chapter 2. I'm going to take a little journey through the text here. And most of our time on this afternoon, we will be camped out in the second chapter of the book of Acts. We'll move around just a little bit to make some points that substantiate what it is that Luke has written for us here. But for the most part, thank you, Brother John. For the most part, we will camp out here for a little while. So make sure that you got your Bibles, whatever copy you got, electronic, paper, whatever. Thank you, my dear brother. And we'll, we'll sit here and see what it is that Luke has got to tell us about this idea of a church that was produced by the Spirit of God. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in all accord in one place. And suddenly there came from a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the room where they were sitting, the Bible says. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set up on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit <clears throat> gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, my friends, when this was noise abroad, the Bible says the multitudes came together. They were confounded. Why? Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. We're going to find that particular statement being made not once, not twice, not three times, but four times in this particular unit of thought. These people heard the apostles speaking in their own language. Verse number seven. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans. How hear we every one of us in our tongue, the native tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Lib in Egypt rather, the parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, that's what occurs there. That's what occurs there. Here's the point that we want to emphasize at this juncture in our study. My friends, that took place in the 33rd year of our Lord. What it is that Luke describes... As intriguing as it is, and it is intriguing, as interesting as it is, it is interesting, as wonderful as this account is, and that occurrence must have been, we need to realize that this thing happens in the 33rd year of our Lord according to the plan of our God and Father in heaven. It doesn't happen 870 years later. And so whenever we have some charlatans that come about and they tell us 870 years later that what happens to us, and we're going to talk about the history of Pentecostalism in just a moment, what happened to us in 1901 and what happens to us in 1906 is actually the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32. We know that those guys are liars, and that's why I'm not a member of the Pentecostal religious institution. Because they're liars. Because they're charlatans. Do we mean to be, be harsh on this afternoon? We don't. 
And I will repeat something that almost all of our speakers have already mentioned. Look, here's the facts of the matter. We love these people. Don't tell me that I don't. I've told many people in the wake of looking at this particular gospel meeting that the reason why I picked this particular subject is because this is one that's near and dear to my heart. My mother's family come out of Pentecostalism, or she, let me rephrase that. My mother came out of Pentecostalism. Many of her family members are still there, still there. This is the religion that their mother and their grandmother taught them. And my mother was one of seven sisters, and she's got sisters that are still welded in the Pentecostal religious institution. And they, they prod her, and they nag her, and they try to compel and coerce her all the time to go back to that religion. My mother obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ when I was six years old. Amen. She and my father together. She was honest enough. She had enough spiritual integrity about her to be able to look at the word of God, what God's word's got to say, and understand that what the word has to say certainly does not match up with where the Pentecostal religion is, but it certainly does match up with these people who call themselves members of the church of Christ, and so therefore I'm going to obey the gospel of Christ, be added by God to that church. Very thankful for that. We don't mean to be hard-hearted, because we are certainly not. We don't mean to sound harsh. That is not the intention. But the fact of the matter is, whenever religions are established by men who show themselves to be charlatans, show themselves to be unworthy of honesty, show themselves not to be men of integrity, there's a problem there. There's a problem there. And your brother John Hall did such a remarkable job on the other night. And someone, John had mentioned as we were talking about, you know, his dealing with the Mormon religion, says, you know, look, I didn't get to get to so much of what that religion entails. One of my words to him was this, you didn't have to. Guess what, man? You chopped that religion off right at the knees. What else do you got to do, man? Look, Brother Rick, if I'm in a fight with somebody and I can take out their knees, it's probably over at that point. You know, I, was, I was a martial artist, and so that's why, where that illustration comes from. But look, you know, you can take out their knees, and, and that's generally where it's over. There's some vulnerable points on a man's body, and that is certainly one of them. John took him out at the knees, so he didn't have to deal with anything else. And the fact of the matter is, we find so many problems with the Pentecostal religion. And some of the things that we just mentioned are some of the things that we see right up front. The very first thing is whenever the people begin to assess what is going on on that particular occasion, on that Pentecost day, following the resurrection and the ascension of our Savior, guess what? They begin to verbalize what their assessment is of what is going on, beginning there in verse number 12. And then Peter properly responds to them and corrects their assessment. What were the assessments? Let's look at what the text has got to say. Verse number 12. For the second time, Luke tells us, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? And so they see these guys, again, four times the Bible tells us that they were speaking in the languages of those nations that were represented there on the day of Pentecost. We hear these men. We hear what they're saying. They're speaking in our language. We understand the wonderful works of God that they're talking about because they're speaking our languages. We'll talk about the language a little bit more here in just a moment or the Greek words that, that Luke uses to refer to tongues or languages. And so they see that, and they were all amazed. They're, they're in doubt. They say, what means this? The Bible says in verse number 13, others mocking say that these men are full of new wine. The full of new wine. I always was so very entertained by that particular statement in the Bible. And so here you have men who are able to speak in other vernaculars of the world. They're able to proclaim and articulate the word of God in different languages. And the assessment is that they must be drunk. It must be, I mean, you ever heard somebody try to talk this drunk? Man, they can't speak their own language, less known someone else's language. And so always was very entertained by that assessment. But sometimes men are not very logical in their assessments, especially when it comes to religious matters. But here's the point. Peter speaks up. And he corrects these incorrect assessments beginning there in verse number 14. Notice what he says, but Peter standing up with the 11 lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, 
Look, here's what I need you to do. I want to make this known to you. I want you to hearken unto my words, for these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it's only the third hour of the day. In other words, 9 o'clock in the morning. But this, Peter says, what you see going on, what you are witnessing here today in Jerusalem on this Pentecost, this is what was spoken of in the prophecy of Joel. He goes on to quote the prophecy, Joel chapter 2, verse number 28, the verse number 32, verbatim. And it should come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show, show wonders in the heavens above. I will show signs in the earth beneath, fire and, and vapor and clouds of smoke, he says. Or excuse me, for blood, fire, vapors of smoke. The sun should be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Verse number 21 is so very important. And it shall come to pass when in this day this under consideration in Joel's prophecy in this day that Peter and the other apostles are standing in right there and all the observers he says it will come to pass in that day that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved don't forget that my friends these things are going to be very important to us as we progress throughout this study in just a moment there are some things that are inseparably linked to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that simply cannot be separated. Pentecostalism wants to try to separate three very key and critical components of this particular event that cannot be separated. We know that they are not legitimate because they try to separate something that God has put together. And over in the book of Matthew chapter 19, we see Jesus Christ as he would respond to those Pharisees who would come to him and say, hey, is it okay for us to put away our wives for any cause? And of course he would say, have you not read that he that made them in the beginning, made them male and female, said for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife. There are no more two, there are one, the Bible says. Therefore what God has joined together... Let not man put asunder. We know contextually that our Lord is talking about marriage there. But we can certainly take that same truth and apply it to anything in the Bible. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Pentecostalism strives to take and put asunder, tear asunder, some things that are inseparably connected to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so we'll talk more about that in just a moment. I want us to visit three areas of study on this afternoon in regards to Pentecostalism and the, the problems that exist with it. Number one, I want us to look at Pentecostal history. It's not going to be an elaborate look at Pentecostal history. It will be pretty much a snapshot, for time's sake, of Pentecostal history. So I want us to look at Pentecostal history. My wife, man, if you had stayed at the airport a little bit longer, we could have given more extensive history of Pentecostalism. But because you're here, um, you know, i got to get done, got to get out of this pulpit at some time. So we'll look at a snapshot of Pentecostal history, number one. Number two, we're going to look at some fundamental discrepancies. We've already seen one, but we'll look at some more fundamental discrepancies. Number one, Pentecostal history. Two, fundamental fundamental discrepancies, and then in the third place, we will look at some doctrinal disparities. And my friends, before we are done, you will understand beyond any shadow of a doubt, you probably already do, but we will reinforce these things for you that no one has any business being a part of the Pentecostal religious institution. If I call this thing a church, I did it by accident because it is not a church. In any shape, form, or fashion, as Jason has already quoted, my friends, there is but one church. From Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, God has placed all under his feet, given him the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Ephesians 4, verse number 4, there is one body, just one, my friends, one spirit. Just as you call him, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. There is only one church. Pentecostalism is not a church. It is an imposter. It is something that has no right or authority to exist. Number one, though, let's look at Pentecostal history. As we talk about Pentecostal history, I want us to look in the first place at the particulars. Secondly, we'll look at some problems. Number one, particulars. Particulars. This is a, a religious institution that was established somewhere between 1901 
and 1906. And you say, well, what do you mean between 1901 and 1906? Generally, there are two people that are credited as the fathers and the founders of the Pentecostal religion or faith, as they like to call themselves. Number one was a man by the name of Charles Far Fox Parham. This is a man who came out of the Methodist religious tradition. He was a Methodist, but he had a couple of doctrines, a couple of beliefs that he espoused that got him kicked out of the Methodist religion. One of those was his affinity for the idea of miraculous healing. And so he became enamored with the idea of miraculous healings. You know, put in your mind somebody like Benny Hinn today. Yeah, that's who he was back in the early 1900s. So he becomes enamored with that. He also has this very strange doctrine called Anglo-Israelism. We'll talk more about that in just a moment very briefly. But he had established a school in Topeka, Kansas called Bethel Bible College in order to try to promote his idea, his, his notion of modern day faith healing. And so he starts this school and of course it's a short term school people can go there and, and, and stay there for I think it was something like six, seven, eight, nine weeks, pay $1,500 which in 19, uh, oh, uh, 1900 that's a lot of money to pay to go to a six, seven week school but again charlatans man Peter tells us about these guys man they're about making merchandise of others. Second Peter chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. Paul says these people want to make spoil of you. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Paul also tells us in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse number five, uh, 3 through 5 that they suppose godliness is monetary gain. They've never been different from the first century till now. These charlatans they're racketeers my friends. They do what they do to fill their pockets, to buy their, their private jets, to live in their mansion that's why they do what they do. They've sold their soul for the dollar bill. And Charles Parham was no different than that. And so he begins to, to promote in this school that, that we need to tarry for the coming of the Holy Spirit, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here's a guy who started a Bible college and didn't have enough sense to understand that what he said that they're going to tarry for has already happened 1,870 years earlier. What do you have to tarry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for? It has already occurred. It has already occurred. But they suppose they're going to do that. He talks with his students and they come up, they, they study the word together well enough to understand that there is a tangible evidence of those who have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. What is that tangible evidence? The ability to speak in tongues. All right, so we see that in the book of Acts chapter 2 where the apostles were concerned. The only other place in the Bible that records Holy Spirit baptism is Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and his family. One of the things that Peter mentions as he recounts witnessing the baptism of Cornelius and his family in Acts chapter 11 is exactly what happened to them, or happened to us rather, happened to them. And so we can agree with Parham that a tangible evidence of baptism of the Holy Spirit was the ability to speak in tongues. And so they decide that they're going to tarry on New Year's Eve, 1900, year of our Lord, 1900, they're going to tarry for the Spirit and wait for the ability to speak in tongues. One of his students, a woman by the name of Agnes Osmond, she tells Parham, well, here's what I think needs to happen. I think you need to lay hands on me and then I'll be able to speak and tongues. And so Parham obliges. He lays his hands on her and according to the record she begins to speak in tongues. And for the next several consecutive days they begin to speak in tongues as their record goes. How interesting is that? I always thought this is something that, that, that has blown my mind. If he had enough sense to study the scriptures to understand that speaking in tongues is a manifestation, a tangible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Did he not have enough sense to understand that the only people who could transfer the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit was the apostles. He couldn't do it. Philip couldn't do it in Samaria. Peter and John had to go to Samaria and do it. My friends, we understand that, but he didn't obviously didn't have that much or didn't study that far ahead in the scriptures. So anyway, that goes on. Many people credit that with the beginnings of the Pentecostal movement. They call themselves the apostolic faith movement. 
All right, so they began then. But later on, Parham would do a lot of traveling. He ends up in Houston, Texas. He does a little seminar over there. He's got a student that comes by, a, a man of African descent by the name of William J. Seymour. And so Seymour comes. He becomes interested in this faith healing thing. He becomes interested in these so-called uh, modern-day miracles. And so he wants to go and see what Parham has got to say. And so he goes, and of course, in those days, uh, he wasn't able to go into the classroom uh, Parham was a uh, devout racist, and his record shows that he was a devout racist. I'll talk to you a little bit more about his uh, Anglo-Israelite uh, doctrine in just a little bit, but he was about races, would not allow Seymour to come into the class. He told him he had to sit out in the hallway, and so he sits out in the hallway and, and listens to what has to be said, becomes a student, a disciple of Parham. Eventually, he gets an opportunity to go to L.A., to Los Angeles, California, to take over a particular religious institution there on 312 Azusa Street. And so they would start in 1906 what becomes known in history as the Azusa Street Mission and Revival. And so there they decided that they were going to begin to, to tarry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this revival lasts in L.A. for three years. My friends, this happens in 1906. One of the foremost historians of the Pentecostal religion is a man by the name of Cecil Robeck. And Cecil Robeck speaks in regards to the Azusa Street Revival. As a matter of fact, he wrote a, a book on it, wrote several articles that have been published in peer-reviewed magazines in regards to the Azusa Street Revival, and he says, that, look, to, in order to get my information, he says, I actually interviewed people who were there. Now, uh, Robeck is an older man, he says, everybody that was there is dead now, but he says, look, before they died, I was able to interview them personally. He had collected a whole lot of newspaper clippings because this thing was so outlandish in L.A. that it brought people from all over the world. There were newspaper reporters everywhere, you know, recording what was going on there. I'm talking about recording this way, not like this with this. They were recording what is going on, and so there's a wealth of information available where firsthand eyewitness, eyewitness accounts are able to be examined in regards to this. And so he talks about some of that. Some of that. I I want you to, to listen to what it is that uh, that he has he's got to say. All right, and so those are some of the particulars of Pentecostal history. I want to get into some of the problems. Here's one of the problems that stands out in my mind. Robeck writes in regards to this particular situation. He again he wrote a book called The Azusa Street Revival and its importance or the beginning of global Pentecostalism. He says this, he says fly up here messing with me. All right, he says, um, let me get to where I want to be. He says, after concluding with the stu that students miraculously, well, that's the one about Osmond. Um, yeah, here we go. Pastor William Seymour, an African-American disciple of Parham's, was perpetrator of this event wherein participants, now listen to what they did at the Azusa Street Revival, and did this over the course of three years, had a three-year revival that took place. Says that they spoke in tongues. Okay, well, that's what the Bible says happened when people were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They prophesied. All right, the Bible says that as well. Says as they preach divine healing, and now we're getting on some shaky ground. So they went into trances, they saw visions, they engaged in other phenomena such as, listen to this carefully, jumping, rolling, laughing, shouting, barking, as they fell under the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> barking, barking. L let me tell you this. If you know anything about modern day Pentecostalism, doesn't shake in his head, I know what you're thinking, man. It gets worse than that, doesn't it? It gets far worse than that. Like I said, my, my family, my mother's side, many of them are still steeped in this stuff. And it gets far worse than that. Man, I'm talking about foaming at the mouth. I'm not saying any of my family members are, are doing, going that far. But, but yeah, I don't know. I don't go to their worship services, so they very well may be. But I'm talking about foaming at the mouth. I'm talking about doing the jitterbug. I'm talking about doing the centipede down the middle of the aisle. Look, look I, I was, Mike's the only one who knows what I'm talking about when I say it. All right. But there's an old dance back in the day where you get on your, st get on your stomach and, and do like that. You might see an NFL football player do it once in a while. But, but, but I was watching a video not too long ago, a couple of years ago. I forget who sent it to me. It's on YouTube. 
but they were showing a Pentecostal worship service. They obviously got a camera mounted in the back of their building right here, back of the auditorium or front, whatever perspective you're looking at it. But back there, they've got cameras mounted. So they're showing this, this service, and, man, people are running around like crazy, man. It looked like a bunch of rabbit dogs. They're running around like crazy. And then you see one guy, they got a stage here just like this in the baptistry. You see a guy, man, he actually comes up here to the podium. He gets a running start. He runs all the way to the back of the building. He's waving at the camera. Then he turns around and runs back full speed, jumps on the stage, boom, jumps right into the baptistry. Splashes water all over the place, jumps out of the baptistry and takes off running again like a maniac. I'm like, what in the world is going on? These people say that this is how we are to believe and know that they have the Holy Spirit. That's a problem. That's a problem. My friends, when I open up my Bible, I see two instances, the only two that you find in all of the book. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 11, and verse number 3, John the Immerser is the speaker. And he says, look, he says, truly, or indeed, I baptize you with water. But there is one that's coming after me. He who comes after me is worthy of more glory than me. I'm not even worthy to bear his shoes. He says, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And with fire, I believe he's talking to two different groups right there. The Pentecostals believe he's talking to one, and that Holy Spirit baptism and fire baptism are, are, are synonymous. Uh, I don't believe that from my study of the Word of God. But nonetheless, John says this is going to happen. And when it actually does happen, the Holy Spirit would have Luke to record both instances of it. And you look in the text and you understand what happens when a man is baptized or a group of people are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Was Peter jitterbugging? Was James doing the centipede? Was it, that, that what was happening? Did Bartholomew go and dive into the baptistry or wherever they were, the, the river, or whatever? Is that what happens? That's not what you see. Man, whenever you look at modern day Pentecostalism, what you see is people that look like they have absolutely gone mad and lost their minds. Is that what you see, though, whenever people are baptized with the Holy Spirit? We make sure that we. Realize and understand that. So that's their problem. That's one of the problems. Their means of transference is, is problematic. We've talked about that already. The Bible says only apostles had the ability to transfer the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit. Wrote a group of articles for the Kinder Courier newspaper a number of years ago called or dealing with Pentecostalism, it was called Stuck in Infancy. Stuck in Infancy did a series of about four articles. And one of the articles we dealt with is we know there's no such thing as modern day miracles because the means by which those modern day miracles could be transferred from one person to another no longer exists. The apostles were the only ones that had the ability to lay their hands on someone and cause them to be able to receive the supernatural ability of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? The apostles are gone. They've been gone, my friends for almost 2,000 years. And so there is no ability to transfer it. But yet and still they claim that Holy Spirit baptism and, and supernatural gifts of the Spirit still occur today. The meaning of tongues. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. And I told you we would talk about the language that you, Luke uses here. And so there are two English translations of two words, and they're utilized synonymously and interchangeably in this text. And so the Bible talks about tongues, verse number 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That is the dative plural of the Greek noun glossa. Glossa. That's the word tongues. It simply means languages. That's it. We use that terminology in English all the time. Mike, what is your native tongue, brother? English is his native tongue. He understands what I'm talking about when I ask him what is his, his native tongue. And so no big surprise there. It simply means languages. A little bit later on, the Bible uses the term language in verse number 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. That is the word dialecto. Dialecto. That is the dative singular of, of the idea of dialectos. And what does it sound like? Dialect. And if you look up what the word dialect means, that means a, a vernacular that is, particular, that is peculiar to a particular group of people. My friends, it's a language. It's a language. And so it's a problem when we look at Pentecostalism and we talk about the, the means of transference, that becomes a problem. But in the second place, the meaning of tongues or languages, that becomes problematic for them. It becomes problematic for them. Because if you ever listen to someone 
in the Pentecostal institution who claims that they've got the ability to speak in tongues, what are they doing? Spouting out a bunch of unintelligible, ecstatic gibberish. And my friends, they've even done scientific tests on this. I didn't research this myself. There was a, a, a man that was being courted by the Pentecostal religion back in Kendall, Louisiana, and they were courting him so hard he had married a woman who was Pentecostal, and so he started going with her, and, and he's very kind of, he's kind of skeptical, rightfully so. Whenever you, If you're not familiar with something, you need to be skeptical, and you need to research it. And so he starts researching. He said, you know, he told me, Terrence, look, I found a book where they had actually done a study and, you know, of Pentecostals who claim to be speaking in dialects of the world, and they've tested these things. You know, they had linguists come in and test these things, and they say they're not speaking any known language. It's just ecstatic gibberish. They've scientifically tested that and come to that and drawn that conclusion. But yet still, these guys claim they're doing what the apostles were doing on the day of Pentecost, and it's just a fraud, and we need to make sure that we see through that. Now, here's how they kind of cover up. Once it becomes discovered, you know, even through scientific means, that all they're doing is, is spouting a bunch of unintelligible gibberish, well, they come up with something to try to, try to counter that. We're door knocking. When we were in the School of Preaching at Brown Trail a number of years ago, some of the students and myself, we would go door knocking on Saturdays, about four or five of us, and we were door knocking in, in the neighborhood where my wife and, and my kids and, 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 and I stayed, or me stayed, and so um, we come to a particular house, and, and there's a lady there. She answered the door, and, and she was very happy to talk with us, but she told us, oh, you know, I'm Pentecostal. She was part of an apostolic something, something or another. And, and so, so we got to talking about some of the things we're looking at today. We're like, well, look, you know, the Bible teaches us that, you know, these tongues that they would cease, that this miraculous knowledge is going to vanish away, the prophecies are going to fail. First Corinthians chapter 13 tells us that very clearly. She said, oh, no, no, we can still speak in tongues and this and that. And so she commenced to doing a demonstration for us. So R.L. Clark and I are standing there on the porch, BJ, man, she just gets to, man, man, she's gone. She gets it going. And when she gets done, I'm like, you know what, you know, we, that didn't sound like any language that we've ever heard. You know, I'm no linguist, but, but somebody speaking Russian, man, I, I know that's, that's Russian. Somebody speaking German, I know that's German. Somebody speaking Spanish, I know that's Spanish. Somebody speaking French, I know that's French. I can identify it. I can't speak, but I can identify it. Italian, you know, I, you know, I can identify it. Like, you're not speaking any known language. That was just a bunch of ecstatic gibberish. Nobody understands what you're saying. And her words were, well, that's our angelic prayer language. Our angelic prayer, oh, that's convenient. You know, this is the language of angels. But we said, you know what? You don't get off the hook so quickly even with that. Because you go over to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. Paul is talking about the exercise of these miraculous gifts. He says, look, if you are praying in an unknown tongue, nobody understands what you're saying but God. She claimed that God understood what she's saying. Paul says, if nobody understands what you're saying but God, shut up. Shut up. All right, and my wife told me don't say shut up from the pulpit. Said the mamas are, mamas are trying to teach their babies not to say shut up and stupid. But let me tell you, baby, there's a lot of other speakers that said stupid this week as well. So, so I just want to let you know I'm not, I'm not the only one. You know, remember you used to do that when you were a kid? You know, hey, everybody's doing it. So, so when it comes to saying stupid, <laughs> I'm not the only one. I heard it about four times. Man, some of this stuff is stupid. It's ridiculous. I mean, that's what it is. Baby, I, I can't help it. All right, so, so look, it is what it is. And so her explanation was absolutely ridiculous. And even if it made any sense, it would still be contradictory to what the Bible says about what she claimed to be doing. We need to realize and understand that. Had a good friend also in Kinder, Louisiana, a number of years ago that he was Pentecostal. And one night we were studying the Bible about 1130 in the evening, we played some guitars and then rode some motorcycles and then went to study the Bible. And we, we studied until about 1130. And man, he got to telling me his experiences, man. You know, no Bible, no book, chapter, verse for anything. I just want to tell you what I experienced. And if you've ever tried to sit down and interact with Pentecostals from a religious perspective, that's all they want to do is tell you what we experienced, what we experienced. And so he still starts telling me, I know, I know I spoke in tongues. I know I was prophesying in tongues. And, and this happened. I kept telling him, I, I'm, brother, you didn't. You know, you didn't. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says that you didn't. 
and he kept on, he keeps, you know, he's appealing from emotion, which is what they do. He's appealing from emotion. No, brother, you can't tell me that I didn't experience something that night. I experienced it. And finally, I realized I'm like butting my head up against a wall trying to, to contend with him and telling him that he didn't, didn't experience what he said he did. Finally, I can see that. I'm like, well, okay, maybe you did experience something. Who am I to take away your religious experience? I wasn't with you. No man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man that's in him, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But here's what I do know. You've described to me what happened to you. And when I read Acts chapter 2, it's different. It's different. When I read Acts chapter 10, it's different. So whatever religious experience you are having, guess what? I'm not going to argue with you about that. That's your experience. All I can, can do is listen to what you tell me happened to you and then show you from Acts chapter 2 that that's not what happened to Peter. And that's not what happened to James and John. So what's happening to you is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I've got evidence to be able to prove that. Pentecostal history is particular as its problems. Move on. Some fundamental discrepancies. Fundamental discrepancy. If Pentecostalism claims to be the true church of God, and they do, I don't know if you know that. They do. They claim to be the true church of God. Like I said, my mother's sisters have tried to pull her out of the church of Christ for years in the Pentecostal. Why are you doing that? Because they believe that we're wrong and they're right. If I believe that you're okay where you are, then why would I try to pull you out of that religion into mine? If I believe you're okay, I know there, there, there's a large constituency religiously of people who have bought into this postmodernistic idea that I'm okay, you're okay. Let's sing Kumbaya. But that's not the Pentecostals. They believe they are the church of God. Matter of fact, some of them even name themselves the church of God or assemblies of God, things like this. The church of God in Christ is the particular brand that my mother's family is a part of. They claim to be God's true church. Then there are some fundamental discrepancies that they are going to have to deal with. Number one, when it comes to God's church, the Bible tells us the person who founded it, right? Who founded the Lord's church? The Lord. Surprise, surprise. All right, it's called the Church of Christ in Romans chapter 16 and verse number 16. Why? Because Christ founded it, it belongs to Him. We look at places like the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verse number 12 to verse number 13. Nathan the prophet is speaking to David the king, and he says that, look, when your days be fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, God says, I will set up your seed after you who shall proceed out of your loins. He says, I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The prophecy is that one of the lineage of David will be the, the kingdom builder, will be the builder of the house of of God, which is the church of Christ, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 14 and 15. Paul tells Timothy, I write unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And so the church of God, the house of God is going to be built by a descendant of David. David was a Jew from the tribe of Judah. Charles Parham as of European descent or ancestry. Uh, Seymour was of African descent. Neither one of these guys fit the prophecy. And so people in the Pentecostal institution need to understand that these guys simply don't fit. The Bible says it's going to be a seed of David, not just any seed of David. You go over to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Brother John talked about this the other night. It's going to be a particular seed of David that bears this title, these monikers, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. That narrows it down beyond any shadow of a doubt. I think about Seymour, think about Parham, neither one of them will ever be worthy of being called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's reserved for Jesus Christ and Him only. So they've got a problem with the person who establishes their religion. In the second place, they've got a, a problem with the place or the location where their particular religious institution is established. As we mentioned from the history, it's established respectively between Topeka, Kansas and L.A., Los Angeles, California. 
Now, I did some research and found out that there are Canadians who are vying for, for a bit of a piece of the pie, and they're saying that you know, we have to look at a, at a, at a polygenetic type of uh, establishment of the, of the Pentecostal institution. You know, L.A., they can't claim it all, and Topeka, Kansas, they can't claim it all. Canada, we want a piece of the pie. We think that Pentecostalism, at least in part, began here as well. Well, guess what? Here's something that I know. I don't care whether we're talking about L.A., or Topeka, or Canada, or Africa, or Asia, or Timbuktu, my friends, it's not Jerusalem. Whenever I look at the Bible, the Bible tells me that Jerusalem is the place where the Lord's church was established, specifically Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And then finally, or in the third place rather, we look at the date. There are some fundamental discrepancies that any man-made denominationalism has to be confronted with. And one of those is date. Somebody's already mentioned during the course of these lectures, Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 44. I think Jason mentioned it just a moment ago. Where the kings of Rome are concerned, the Roman Empire is concerned, Daniel prophesied that in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which should never be destroyed won't fall to other people, but it will break into pieces and consume all of these kingdoms. Talking about the physical kingdoms that he had already mentioned in this prophecy. The Bible lets us know that the Roman Empire is your time frame. Any history buffs in here? When did the Roman Empire begin? Officially. About 27 B.C. Octavian, or Augustus Caesar, as he liked to call himself, was the first official emperor of Rome. Became that in 27 B.C. When did the Roman Empire collapse? The Roman Empire collapsed. 476 A.D. That's about 500 years. You got about a 500-year window in which the Bible says in the Old Testament prophecies that God is going to set up his kingdom, build his house, establish his church. And guess what? Pentecostalism is way too late. Way, way too late. And what about the purpose professed in both prophecy and preaching in regards to what is going on there. There's three things I want you to understand about the purpose. Joel mentions this purpose, and Peter mentions this purpose. Remember, Joel, Peter takes Joel's prophecy and says, that prophecy is what you see going on right now. What is happening in conjunction with God pouring out his spirit upon all flesh? First of all, he's pouring out his spirit upon all flesh, but what is going on in conjunction with that? Number one, the church is being established, right? Is there a connection between... The baptism of the Holy Spirit that Christ prophesied of and the establishment of the church that Christ promised? Nod your heads like this. Yes, there is. In Mark chapter 9 and verse number 1, Jesus Christ tells those who are standing right there with him, look, brother, I say unto you that there be some who are standing right here, right now, who will not taste death till you see the kingdom present with power. With power. There it is. What power are we talking about, preacher? Go over to Acts chapter 1. Just turn your page to Acts chapter 1. Go to verse number 8, and we'll see what power is under consideration when Christ says there are some of you who will not die till you see the kingdom present with power. Verse number 8, but you shall receive power. This is Christ speaking to his apostles before he ascends into heaven. This is post-resurrection. They're in Jerusalem the way Christ told them to be, and he's giving them some final marching orders. He says, look, but you shall receive power. They wouldn't know what power he was talking about from Mark 9. 1 and from Luke chapter 24 verse 46 to 49 says but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you you should be witnesses of me in Jerusalem Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth when the power comes the church comes when the church comes the power comes these are simultaneous events you can't separate what God is joined together, my friends. Here's something else that happens simultaneous to the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Men are going to be saved by calling on the name of the Lord. It happens simultaneous with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then when you see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit over in the book of Acts chapter 10, what is the reason and the purpose? What does Peter say the reason and the purpose is? When you get over to the book of Acts chapter 11, verse 14 through 17, he says, so that we know that God has accepted the Gentile into the covenant of Christ just like the Jew. Now I want you to think about this. If the Spirit doesn't get poured out until 1901, 
according to Parham, 1906, according to Seymour in the Pentecostal religion, then what are the irresistible implications of that? Number one, the church is not established until 1901 or 1906. Salvation is not available through calling on the name of the Lord until 1901 or 1906. And the Gentile is not accepted into the covenant of Christ until 1901 or 1906. Who's ready to believe that? Who's ready to believe that? It's ridiculous. Everybody up until 1901 is lost. Everybody up to 1906 is lost. But the Holy Spirit is not poured out. The prophecy of Joel is not fulfilled according to these guys until 1901, 1906. And so we have to deal with those things. As we draw to a close here, there's so many scriptural disparities. We've talked about some of these things. There are three tangible evidences of Holy Spirit baptism in Acts chapter 2. See it in the text. What are they? Number one, you see or you hear a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Number two, you see cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of these guys. Number three, you hear them speak, not ecstatic, unintelligible gibberish, but you hear them speak in the intelligent vernaculars and dialects of the world. Those are your tangible evidences. And these things are very different than Pentecostalism. The point of fulfillment, Peter says, this is the time in which Joel's prophecy is being fulfilled. Parham says, no, it was fulfilled in 1901, New Year's Day. The confirmation of the Word of God. I'll go over to Mark real quickly. Mark chapter 16. And Jesus Christ again is giving some final words of instruction to his apostles before he goes back to heaven. And you look at verse number 15, which we're familiar with. He says unto them, go you to all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with a new tongue, with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if any man drink anything, if any drink anything deadly, shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Speaking to the apostles here. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord, working with them and doing what? Confirming the word with signs following. Signs following. The word of God doesn't get confirmed according to their doctrine until 1900. If their doctrine is true, we know the doctrine is not true. We know that it is false. My friends, when it comes to Pentecostalism and the Lord's church, one of these things is not like the other. Remember exercise that, you, that your little babies did in, in preschool? One of these things is not like the other. Man, you got a whole sheet full of, full of images. You know, there's, there's sets of three, you know, four or five, six sets of three. One of these things is not like the other. And she's got the circle, the one that's not like the other. There might be two bananas and an apple. Which one of these things is not like the other? It's a simple exercise, isn't it? When it comes to Pentecostalism, my friends, one of these things is not like the other. Pentecostalism is not the faith of Christ. The Pentecostal institution is not the church of Christ. And for that reason, I'm not a member of it. Not a member of it. Got ants that I love dearly. Love with all of my heart. And they know that this is the truth. Wouldn't have to convince them how much I love them. But we'll not join them in their error. Because the Pentecostal institution is not the, is not the church of Christ. And here's the crazy thing about it. And the beautiful thing all wrapped up in one. That if they want to be the church of God so badly, why don't they be it? The Lord's not trying to keep them out of the church. He wants them in the church. He's not trying to keep them out. And why does anybody need to come along and try to reinvent the will? The church of Christ has already been established. Man, if I really did spend a whole lot of time, money, resources, and effort to invent this, I'd be a fool. Because it got invented in 1789 by Thomas Edison already. I'd be a fool. Want to be the Lord's church? Be the Lord's church. Here's how you do it. Listen to the gospel. 
give a listening ear to the truth. Remember, we just quoted from Mark 16, verse number 15, going through the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that he believes and is baptized shall be saved. Listen to what God has got to say and believe it. Repent of your religious error. Confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Be buried with him in water baptism. Don't worry about Holy Spirit baptism. That's not for us. That was for them. It's not for us. It was for them. The one baptism that Jason mentioned a moment ago is water baptism for the remission of sins. Why? Because that's where God applies the blood of Christ to the soul of the sinner and washes his sins away. Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16. As we close this lectureship, gospel meeting, and we just want to reiterate what's already been said, man. We love the souls of men. Will we take time to do something like this if we did not? If I don't care about you, then I'm not going to say anything about something that's going to send you to hell eternally. I wouldn't care. Do what you want to do. Not worried about you. Not worried about you. But we do what we've done this week because we do care. And we do love our neighbors. And we care about them. Don't want to see one soul in hell. Just like God is not desirous of the damnation of anybody. First, first Timothy chapter 2 verse number 4. Wants all men to be saved. We do too. And so we implore our neighbors who are parts of man-made religions. And come out of that stuff. God loved you enough, loved me enough to make a body for the second member of the Godhead. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 5. He tabernacled in that body, gave up the glory of heaven, the glory that he had with the Father before the world began. John chapter 17, Christ gave it up to come tabernacle in the body, to condescend and tabernacle in the flesh. Why? So that he become the sacrifice that we need to be able to have our souls cleansed from sin, for us to be reconciled to God, redeemed from iniquity, to have a church that we can function in faithfully until the Lord comes back and takes us home. Anything that anybody else has done is an insult to God and to Christ and to the sacrifice of our Lord. Let's implore our neighbors. Let's make sure that we do what we need to do faithfully in the Lord's church. If we can help anybody this afternoon as we close, won't you come as we stand and sing? I want to say, Brother Terrence, thank you very much. Very strong, powerful sermon. And I did want to tell you, though, that a little bird told me that your wife also used the word stupid in her class. Just that's for later. <laughs> but, you know, we, we're not trying to be harsh, but, brethren, there are foolish things in this world. I mean, sometimes you just have to get down to it. Acts chapter 13, you're dealing with someone that believes they can do modern day miracles. Okay, fine. You can do a miracle, strike me blind, just like uh, Paul struck Edom as blind. Prove it. In the old days, they really got with it. They'd put poison uh, on, on the uh, you know, uh, podiums and say, you believe you can drink it, drink it. Problem today is you'd say that, somebody drink it and kill them, you can go to jail. They don't even understand those miracles, and they were temporary, and they've ceased. 1 Corinthians 13, Ephesians 4. And it's sad, but we must study with people. You notice today, I purposefully took off my Texas School of Preaching pen because of the lesson I had particularly, and I put on my Fishers of Men hook. We need to remember that we have to go out into the world, and we have to teach people the gospel so that they can obey the gospel. And let me just say this, too, in case anybody wants to talk about me and Terrence preaching long. Nehemiah chapter 8. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear and understand upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street, that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday. For the men and the women and those that could understand, the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Y'all have been a very good audience this week. And guess what? After one song and the closing prayer, y'all can go rest.